Is this everyone? Do you know if everyone signed up has is here right now? Um, I think there's people missing, but you can go ahead and start. It's already 15 minutes. Okay, so th does everyone have a USB cable? Yes? Yeah. So go ahead and connect the Arduino to like the USB, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and start. Um, is the camera fine as well? Everything's working? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I, I'm not going to go ahead and show you actually like the full presentation slides because I realize that there's going to be some technical difficulties associated with that. So we'll just work with this, uh, working with it like this. Um, so I'm George. Um, so I'm a senior BME and also a double E. And um, the Arduino was something that I picked up sometime in my freshman year. Um, before I did that, I did robotics and we used like uh, microcontrollers to go ahead and control robots to do automatic stuff. It was called Botball in, in the years that I was doing it. Um, so doing this stuff was actually kind of a pickup of what I was doing previously in high school. And I'll go ahead and show you um, it's just a couple things you can do with the Arduino. Um, this is pretty hectic. There's kind of, quite a lot of information we're going to cover. Um, but I'm going to try my best to explain a lot of the concepts of the Arduino that will, you'll find actually very, very useful. Um, so let's go ahead and begin. Um, so the concept of the Arduino is that it's, okay, so everyone thinks it's a microcontroller. It's not a microcontroller. It's a development platform. So actually in the very, very center of the chip, there you'll see this black thing. And actually that is the um, microcontroller. So everything else is a, a myriad of peripherals that have been put onto this board that help you to program this thing and can do some of the basic, add, add some basic functionalities to it as well. Um, it's, it's actually based off the Admiral 18 Mega series, which are 8-bit microcontrollers. Um, it's, and the great news about this is that it's open source and C and C++ based. Um, so another disclaimer, though, is that they've recently released an ARM series. You guys don't understand this information at all, but might as well just tell you guys. Um, so they've also released an ARM series that's a different type of microcontroller line that's compatible with Arduino now. Um, OK, so, um, so if you typically just go on to the web, like if you just type in like Arduino project in Google, this is what I did, you'll find that a lot of people are actually kind of doing these things with Arduino. So you can see that people are making quadcopters and robots with this sort of stuff. But, there's, but overall, by itself, it's a microcontroller. So it can do a variety of tasks. So by itself, an, a microcontroller, what it does is it really allows you to program something. So think of like a very, very tall, small computer is what it is. So you can program it to do something. It'll, it can send digital outputs to something. It can read and sense your data back in. You can do a myriad of things. You can stack microcontrollers together, connect them, wire up like that to make some sort of like computer cluster if you wanted to. Um, but we're going to go ahead and just not overwhelm you and just keep things very, very simple. Um, <laughs> so in my freshman year, what I did with this Arduino was I actually made, um, based off the MakeZine um, Garduino. So the Garduino was pretty much an Arduino that was an automatic like garden feeder. Um, I turned it into the Carney Garduino, so it was used for carnivorous plants in terms of, so I had it hooked up, so what it did was it fed it, it, che it checked humidity data, it checked the temperature data, and adjusted and regulated the levels accordingly. Um, so I actually have a video, which I still have, back in the repository of like all the small things that I've ever done. The question is whether or not this thing will play. Um, but it, it was a fun little rig that I did um, back in freshman year. It took me like, I would say, two months to do to get to assemble the parts and put everything up together and find the space to do it. Um, but we pretty much what it did was it would send the data to an LCD display and um, it would tell you if it needed to be updated or do something else. Unfortunately, the hue isn't really well, but um, the video, once we actually have this uploaded onto YouTube, it'll be a lot nicer. Um, but overall, the inherent idea was that it actuated like some humi humidity, like some, um, it had a sensor and it also had these like humidifiers. So if they need to get more humid, you would be, I would actually, actually actuate the humidifiers and actually make the area more humid. Um, because, the, because carnivorous plants need a specific type of temperature condition and weather condition to actually survive. So this was a very, very fun project that I did. Um, so in other, um, on, the, on the other side notes, um, just moving on with the context, um, these things are actually very, very powerful. Um, so are you guys, do you guys know what this is? Have you guys ever heard of this before? Um, do you guys know what happened in 2011? So in 2011, the Fukushima nuclear power plants had a meltdown, right? So what happened is that Tokyo Hackerspace decided to use the Arduino platform to make a Geiger counter um, that you could deploy and give to civilians. And the great part is that because it had an Ethernet shield on it, you can connect it to the internet and actually can stream the data automatically. So what they were capable of doing is they distribute the stuff out and then they were able to actually have like a real-time map of the overall radiation levels around the general area. So instead of actually relying on government data to figure out radiation levels, you could actually get real-time data from civilians around the area. So that was one of the actually impressive things about what you can do with an Arduino. Um, but overall, this is, this is really just to get you started into the concept of microcontrollers. And as you can see, there's a lot of different like, levels. So this is just like a general understanding of the hierarchies and possibilities of it. Um, but there's, in terms of general complexity, you gotta consider, there's generally one thing that I'd like to consider when it comes to the general level of complexity of a microcontroller. 
Um, so you can think about it as instruction sizes. Um, so we have 8-bit microcontrollers, which are on the very, very small end, uh, the very, very small end of things. Um, and then as you can see, you could, once you go up to 64-bit, you have something that can possibly use for like a smartphone. Um, the 32-bits is based on the ARM series, and the 16-bit is the MSP430, is a typical type of microcontroller. Um, so the general, general idea is that as you increase your instruction size or register size, you, you are capable of doing more complex computations. Okay, but anyways, um, I do have a website, um, a YouTube channel, so it's called BME Builds, and if you guys are interested in this stuff, what we do um, is that we don't teach you Arduino, but we teach you how to program ARM controllers. So I did say that Arduino is an 8-bit microcontroller, ARM controllers are 32-bit, so you can do a lot more, and it's, a, it's actually pretty straightforward, so it's C-based as well. So once you learn Arduino, it's very, very easy to just convert into this if you ever need more computational power for your projects. Okay? All right, so a couple of pros. Um, so why do we want to start with Arduino as a, as a learning platform? So first off, it's simple software and it's free. So if you were to actually get a microcontroller, actually start programming it, if you didn't use the Arduino, in most instances you would have to buy very, very expensive software tools. So one of them is IAR Workbench, another one is like Kale Tools. If you try to get it like just one license, it would cost you like $2,000. Okay, and then the chips don't come. And the chips don't come easy as well. Their development platforms typically go to around three hundred dollars. The general in incentive for this is that you know when you want it, when you're scaling up and you're manufacturing, a big business is okay with spending two thousand dollars for a small license. But for people who are just starting and playing around and prototyping with things, that is a really, really big inhibiting factor. But the fun of this is that because it's open source, you just download it, you just buy a twenty dollar Arduino board, and you're on your way. Um, another pro is that you have a community to go with it because it's community based. Um, you, you effectively have a giant forum, so if you have any sort of questions, you want to do, if you want to search anything, you want to see some past projects, you, they're readily available online, and it's also a great way to just you know kickstart what you want to do, what the next sort of Arduino project you want to do. Um, the last part, in fact, the best part, I think, is that it's open source. So the 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 way that you can actually rig up this, actually create the Arduino by itself, is available. You can actually just they have schematics avail readily available for you. If you want to go ahead and just like recreate an Arduino, and a lot of people actually do sell their own little you know, different Arduino. So like SparkFun sells, I'm I don't know if SparkFun still does, but um, some some distributors will be able to sell their own types of Arduino boards. They're exactly the same in terms of like what an Arduino does, but because it's constructed differently, you can they can sell at a different price if they want to. Um, but in terms of the advantage, because this is an HMDN um, sponsored. Arduino workshop, the, the advantage of learning how to do microcontrollers is that a lot of medical devices use microcontrollers. So and when it comes to any sort of actuation, control system stuff, you need a microcontroller to do stuff. So on the top left, that's an infusion pump. It regulates the amount of drugs you deliver to a patient who is in like um, probably in the ICU. And it's important to regulate it consistently because if you give the drug, if you give too much drug, you pop an overdosage. If you give, if you give too little, it's not enough. So you need to have a microcontroller that can constantly sense the data that's going in and, and then constantly adjust the output if, if necessary. And the pacemakers are implantable devices that if you have some sort of heart problem, arrhythmia, it gets implanted into you and then what, you, what a microcontroller needs to do is it needs to sense your heart activity and see if it's irregular and then be able to pace your heart back to normal paces. But on a longer scale things, you also have just these devices by themselves. So this is like a, a typical like tech, uh, typical device used in like ambulances that can, you know, it can do a myriad of things. So it could get your 12 EKG, you can get your pulse activity values, you can get your blood pressure values, et cetera, et cetera. So like sensing is kind of a, a big deal and my controllers are the way to do it. So we want to keep it, we want to keep this, um, this demonstration very, very focused towards um, kind of a medical type of project. So we decided to do something that was pretty straightforward and also find kind of fun is the electronic blind man's glove. Um, so this is something that was created in the Creative Commons. Um, actually, was something where the idea is you have this one device you can wear on your wrist for a blind man, and it is able to pick up the general area and proximity around you. So if you get if you get too close to something and it picks something that's too close, it would actually uh, tighten up the wrist of the glove and help to tell the person that you know you're too close to something. Go ahead and move aside. Um, this unfortunately isn't something that you would want to have in terms of the FDA level because of just like the general issues associated with the sensing, the sensing, the way that it senses stuff. Um, but, in it, but still, anyways, I think that this is a really good project to start with because it gives you a lot of the key understandings of what you can do with this microcontroller. Um, of course, the problem is because unfortunately, if you can do the time constraints, we're not going to do all of it. We're going to do some of it, and we're going to change, change a couple of things. So we don't have a glove for you guys, unfortunately. Um, we're not going to use two servo motors to tighten the wrist glove because we don't have a glove. But instead, we're going to have a vibration motor that, you know, if you get too close to something, the vibration motor will buzz. 
Um, we're not going to use ultrasound for the first part because it's a different type of sensing way, uh, different, type, different types of sensing modality. What we're going to do instead, we're going to use infrared proximity instead, and that uses one another type of infrared type of technique, another type of like sensing technique that is a little bit more um, that's different from ultrasound. Um, and we are capable of connecting to a nine volt battery jack, but for the sake of just quickly prototyping, we can connect to your USB. And because um, the overall power required for this device is less than 100 milliamps, it's totally okay to just work on the power of the USB. Okay? All right. Um, so just a general note, like this is what our schematic is going to look like. So Arduino by itself isn't just like programming it. It's also knowing how to like connect things up together. Um, so this is like how we're going to hook up the proximity sensor and the motor, um, the motor controller. Um, and the general layout is going to look something like this. Um, and then we're just going to go ahead and move on. So, as I said before, it's a lot of things. It's, you know, how to incorporate software, how to, how to put stuff onto a breadboard and wire things up, and then how to um, just overall make everything work together and actuate and do things. Um, so, I'm pretty sure everyone has downloaded the software. Um, if you guys haven't, you guys should right now. Um, now, there's, there's a little small trick that I have to tell you guys with the driver support. So, if you have a Windows computer, I want you to connect your USB to, you want, I want you to connect the Arduino to your computer, and I want you to follow these instructions. And then once you have the instructions set up, then we can move on. Is everyone good with this? Has everyone done this? Yes? No? So I got one of the last few steps with like uh, <coughs> Arduino.in file, where there is no file in the driver's folder. Like I just selected this uh, folder in mm -hmm. general, and it says it's up to date, so I'm not sure if it's working right now. Okay, so um, we'll, we'll see what happens when we move down. Okay. Um, and if you have problems programming, we'll go back to this, okay? All right, okay, back to this. Um, so the concept is, I want you guys to go ahead and open up the Arduino program software and go ahead and have a look at what gets opened up. Okay, so this is the area where you program. This is, with the, this is the place where you write in here to go ahead and write whatever you want to make the Arduino do, to do stuff. And we'll go ahead and cover a little more in depth what that does. Um, but for the first thing, we're gonna go ahead and do something very, 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 very easy, I'm hoping. We're gonna go ahead and connect an LED to the Arduino and we're gonna make it blink, okay? So grab an LED and connect it to pin 13 and ground. And make sure that the, the, the end of the LED, that is stubby. So say something, um, so the one that has one end like, that has like the stub on the side, make sure that's connected to ground. Or if you wanna have another case example, make sure the longer pin is connected to ground, okay? Everyone good? Yes? Okay, so now I want you guys, is everyone, is everyone good? Yes? No? Good? Okay, so I want you to go ahead and find the Blink program. So I want you guys to go to File, then go to Examples, then go to Basics, and then go to Blink, and then click it. It should open up a new, a new, like, a new Arduino file, and then you're going to go ahead and program that. Yes? File, examples, basics, and then blink. Good. Is it? Is everyone everyone have that opened up? Okay. And then the next step is you want to go ahead and select the right board. So you want to go to tools, then board, and make sure that Arduino Uno is checked, because the concept of the Arduino the Uno the Arduino platform itself is that there's a myriad of boards that you are used for different purposes and are programmed differently. So you want to go ahead and select Uno because you're programming the Uno. Yes? Good? Now go ahead and just press the, the run button, or the program button. Are you good? You're good, and are you good as well? Okay, so everyone's good. Awesome. Okay, cool. We can move on now. That means the setup is complete, and that would have, that is, I assume, would have taken the longest time. Because everyone, because if you have Windows, if you have Windows, it takes forever to do this. Um, Okay, so did it work? Yes, it did. Awesome, cool. We're moving on. Um, so we're going to go ahead, actually, I forgot to go ahead and show you the demonstration. So I'm going to go ahead and show you the demonstration instead. So we're going to do that instead um, before we move on. So I have this already attached right here. Um, if I connect this to my Uno, which I've programmed already to do this stuff, um, what's going to happen is if I get in front of it, it's going to buzz. I'll do this right. There we go. So if I get too close to it, it buzzes. Go away, it doesn't buzz, okay? This, is one, this, is, this one uses the ultrasound sensor. 
Um, the other one is we're actually going to be using the infrared proximity, which is the other one that's faced up here. Um, but I can go ahead and open that up, and I can program it to do that instead. Um, I'm going to go to sketchbook, and it should be called infrared test. Okay. Oh, it's called, uh, sorry, it's analog reader. <laughs> Named it something else, unfortunately. So analog reader, there we go, this should be it. All right, um, okay, so. If I go ahead and move this up and go over here, you can see that it's slightly buzzing because I pre-programmed it to have it some slight buzz, but if I get my hand close to it, the buzz and it go, goes away, then it doesn't. Okay, cool. So that's what we're going to end up doing in overall in this entire demonstration. Um, so let's go back to the PowerPoint and let's go ahead and figure out how this code works. Okay, so I did tell you that it's, it's C++ based. C++ based. Um, so how many guys have a programming background? Any of you guys? Yes, yes, yes. What kind of languages? Java, you guys? Java, C++. Java, C++. So, so you guys don't have to be in this tutorial. I might have to might actually want to skip this stuff because it might bore the hell out of you guys. Um, but inherently, there's two functions. There's two functions to this. There's void setup and void loop. Um, and the concept with this is that in setup, you fill up information on what you want to do when the Arduino turns on. And loop is something that goes on and runs continuously. Um, also use uh, two slashes for comments. Uh, Functions are expressed as some sort of type that gets output or whatever what is the name of the function, something that goes inside brackets. Make sure you use semicolons after each command. Um, just typical coding, like C, C++ coding sort of structure. All right, so um, going down, we're gonna go ahead and dissect this code. All right, so I made you guys use the blink code. So we're gonna go ahead and have some fun to look through this code. And thankfully, they, well com they commented this very, very well, so we don't have to think too much. Um, so let's go ahead and go down from this. So again, I told you setup and loop. So the idea is in setup, you want to put any sort of code that goes in there that when you turn the Arduino on, it'll run it once and that's it. Void loop is as it continues on, it's going to go top to bottom, go back up, top to bottom, repeat, 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 repeat until eternity or it runs out of power. All right. Um, so the next thing is we're going to go ahead and start with the very, very topmost one. And what exactly is pin mode 13 and output? Um, so let's go ahead and figure this out. So this is a little. This is why you need to understand the hardware a little bit more. Um, so we're going to go ahead and cover this a bit more. So the concept is the way that the Arduino Uno is structured is that the topmost pins are digital pins, and the bottom pins right here are analog pins, and these are for power pins. And you can see that they're properly labeled. So there's 13, 12, 11, 10. All the way go, it goes all the way down to zero. Analog, it says A0 all the way to A5, so it just means analog 0, analog 5. Um, we'll go ahead and explain a little bit more about what that means. Um, so what exactly is a digital pin? So typically people, if you, if you were to actually look at a specification sheet, it's called a GPIO. So the general purpose input output pin. The concept of these digital pins is that they can send out a 1 or a 0, or they can read in a, a 0 or a 1. In the case with an Arduino, a 0 means 0 volts and a 1 means 5 volts. So you can output five volts on each of these digital pins with a certain current limit. Um, so unfortunately, the, the draw for this on the USB is 100 milliamps. But another limitation furthermore is that the maximum output it can generate is 500 milliamps at absolute maximum. So you can't actually use all the, you can't actually just, you know, just output five volts at like one amp. That's a, that's a little small limitation of the microcontroller, which we'll talk a little more later. Um, but another thing to keep in mind is because it's an input or output, you can program them to serve as either an input or output. And the program needs to understand if it actually wants to output stuff or wants to read stuff in. So looking at that, you can see that pin mode 13 output means I want to define pin, digital pin 13 as an output. All right? Does everyone get that? Yes? OK. So because now it's an output, this is why you can actually get the LED to blink. So when, it turns, when you see it turning on, it's sending out a 5 volt signal. When it's turning off, you're sending a 0 or a 0 volt signal. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and dissect the code a bit more. You can see that this thing blinks. So there's an understanding of a digital write and delay R. Those are the two key functions that are used here. 
Um, and the concept of a loop is that, again, it goes from the top to bottom and restarts and loops again. Um, so the way that this works is that the digital write function is the one that is used to set if the digital, if the digital pin is going to output a high or a low. In the case with high, it means, again, a 1 or 5 volts. If it means low, it means 0 volts or just a 0. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that these things run on a 60 megahertz clock. Or it could be either 8 megahertz or 60 megahertz, depending on which one you have. Um, so this code runs really, really quickly. Right. So this is why you have the delay. You have this delay function. So the delay is whatever you want to throw into there is an integer that serves in milliseconds. So 1,000 means 1,000 milliseconds, so one second. So you can see the timing when it turns on and off is actually roughly one second. So the way that this code works is that it says digital write, I want to set this to output. I'm going to wait one second before I do anything else because if I don't make it wait one second, it's going to just run repeatedly. You can, in fact, even try, if you want to go ahead and set delay to zero and delay to zero, you'll see that this thing doesn't even turn on at all because it flickers on so quickly that it doesn't do anything or you can't visually see it going on. Okay, and then you want to go ahead and it says digital write 13 low. So again, sets it back to low. Wait one second and then repeat and start again. So that's how it blinks. Does everyone get that? Yes? Okay, cool. Um, now we're going to go ahead and just manipulate the code. So I want you guys to go ahead and play with the code and just change some of the timing operations. And I'm going to go ahead and do this with you guys. So if I go to... Thankfully, in my instance, I don't have to worry about this too much. Um, but what you can do in this instance, so there's a couple things you can play around with here. Um, unfortunately, with the way that this thing is set up, we can't really manipulate 13 too much unless I teach you how to guys how to use a breadboard. So really, the only thing you can really change is the delay here. So if you want, let's just go ahead and just write 500 for the beginning and just program it again. So what's going to happen instead is that it's going to stay high for 500 milliseconds for half a second, and it's going to turn off and wait a second. Is everyone getting the gist here? Is everyone playing around? Does everyone get how this code works? You can throw in any sort of integer into this function. And it's not connected, which is why it's fidgeting. OK. So in the case of mine, like, I don't, it doesn't really matter, because actually on the Arduino, there is an LED that is pulsing on top of it. So you guys are, OK, so does everyone get it? Everyone having fun? OK, we're good. Let's go ahead and move on then. All right, um, OK, so we've covered the basics of the digital pins. And this is kind of the basic fundamental of how we're going to drive this vibration motor. Um, so we're going to go ahead and cover the concept of how to actuate motors. So we want to go ahead and get our startup started with these, with these breadboards. So the concept of these breadboards is that they're a really great prototyping platform. Um, you can actually hook wires up. So if you didn't have this, what happened is that if you wanted to hook any sort of complicated circuit up, you get a myriad of wires and just wrap things together. You don't have to deal with it if you have this. So the general concept with a breadboard is that on the sides right here, there's a piece of metal underneath this. So actually, this is, the underneath, this is what, happened, what it looks like underneath. So everything right here is connected, and everything right here is connected, and everything horizontal in these small sections are connected as well. Um, so typically, when you, when you use this, um, you want to go ahead and power this up. Use this one rail for power. Use this one rail for ground. Just, it's just to make it so that everything is centralized. The power and the ground lines are centralized. So you can go ahead and just probe from here and connect back. Um, is everyone getting this? Um, are you, is everyone familiar with the bread? Has, everyone, has anyone like used a breadboard before? Or is this a completely new topic? OK, it's a little bit new. OK. So this is why I thankfully uh, made these little images for you guys to deal with. Um, but another thing to keep in mind is, have you guys taken in a physics 2 course? Yes? So you guys know what serial connections are, parallel connections are? Good. OK, so the concept is, if you want to connect things in parallel, you can connect them vertically. So you connect one right here and one right here, and the other one right here and the other one right here. You can effectively connect them in parallel. If you want to connect things up in series, you just connect one to the next pin, and then next pin connects here, and then it connects next to next pin. Yes? OK, good. Is everyone getting this? OK. All right, so I want you to go ahead and use the blink code, but change it to pin 10 instead. And I want you to go ahead and hook up an LED onto this breadboard. Very, this should be fairly straightforward. Um, you guys have a resistor, and you guys have an LED. Um, and you guys have plenty of wires in the front of you if you want to use that. 
And again, the way that I hooked this up, just to make sure that you guys understand what's going on, is I connected ground to this pin right here, to the, to the top line right here, and then I connected pin 10 through a resistor, which goes to an LED, and the LED connects back to ground. You guys, you guys see that? Okay, everyone has a blinking, and then unfortunately for you, because you have a dual Minove and it's messing up with your Arduino software, you'll share with him. Okay, cool. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and talk about, about how to drive motors. Um, so everyone is familiar with the motor, yes? So in front of you guys, you guys do in fact have a vibration motor. So what this thing is, is if you were to connect this straight up to five volts and one straight to ground, this thing would start buzzing. And in fact, if you want, you can go ahead and do that. Um, but don't connect it to a digital pin. Um, we'll explain why. Um, the, the, round, the round thing is, is a motor. It's a, buzzy, it's a buzzer motor, and it's typically used for cell phones. So the fact is, the one that I have that I, is actually one that I gutted out of a cell phone. Um, these were actually bought from a distributor. Okay, so anyway, again, the general concept is when it comes to motor, when you want to go ahead and power up a motor, you just want to have it so that it's connected to battery, battery powers motor, motor starts rotating, very, very straightforward circuit. I'm pretty sure that maybe sometime in your elementary years, you've, you've done this before, or at least if not with a motor, then with like a light bulb or something to understand like, you know, circuits, right? Okay, but we talked about this before and the issue is the maximum amount, of digital, maximum amount of current you can output onto these things is 500 milliamps total. And the maximum each digital pin can output is 50 milliamps. Motors require a lot more current than that. So do not, absolutely do not connect a motor to a digital pin. Because what could happen is that it would draw too much current and the digital pin would fry, or it'll completely short and the digital pin would just stop. It does not output anything at all. So that could potentially destroy your microcontroller. Um, so you have to think of other mechanisms to make sure to actually make it so that a digital pin will actually actuate a motor. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and revise the original one. We're gonna add a switch, okay? So if you press the switch down, it turns on the circuit, motor turns on. Release the switch, it turns off, okay? So the mechanism that we're gonna do this is we're gonna make, we're gonna use something called a transistor, all right? So a transistor is pretty much like a switch, but it's electronic gated. So if you were to input, a, an, electric, an electronic signal, it'll actually turn this thing on. And if you turn it off, you actually will, you know, pretty much release the switch. Um, there's a lot more complexities to this, um, but we're just gonna go and just not think about that too much. There are some instances where you actually, if you don't give it any voltage, it will turn something on. If you give it a voltage, it'll turn something off. There are other instances where if you turn, if you, it's the other way around. There are other instances where you, where you require current. There are other instances where you require voltage. It gets, transistor stuff gets very, very complicated very, very fast. We're not gonna think too much. We're gonna get to the point. We're gonna use an NPN type transistor. An NPN transistor is pretty much exactly what I've told you. You give it a current, it turns that thing on. You don't give it a current, it shuts off, okay? And with NPN type transistors, these work really, really best when it comes to draining. Um, so another funny and fun fact about transistors is that they're not like switches too much in the sense of you can put a switch anywhere in the circuit. NPMN transistors do really, really well with driving things back to ground. PNP is the other way around, which is really good at sourcing things. So an NPN, what we want to do is we want to connect that from the bottom of the motor and connect that to ground, okay? So the final revision is we're gonna go ahead and use the 2N3N04. This is a very, very, very common standard NPN type transistor, and we're gonna use that. So it's effectively that little black thing um, that you see. So it's a very, very small, there's three pins. Um, each pin represent, corresponds to one of, the, one of the pins. So two in the instance, which in the middle is the base, that's the one that you can connect the digital pin to. Three is the collector. The collector is where the motor connects to the transistor. And one is the emitter, and the emitter is the place that's gonna connect that to ground, okay? So the final revision, or the next revision, is we're gonna add a transistor, like this, like so, okay? So battery connects to motor, motor connects to transistor, transistor goes back to ground, yes? And the way that this works is that when I give this a one or a five volts, this thing will turn on. When I give it zero volts, it'll turn off the motor. Right? Cool? Makes sense? Very, very, like not, not too intense, right? We can do this. Okay, but you can see that in um, the circuit that I provided, there's a little more elements to it. So I'm gonna go ahead and explain very quickly why we added these elements. 
Um, so the easiest one, the first one, is the first pin, we want to add a resistor that goes inside the transistor, the base of the transistor. The reason why is we want to reduce the current draw from the digital pin, because again, maximum output is 15 milliamps, and transistors don't require, NPN type transistors in this case, don't require a lot of current to turn things on. So you're okay with having a 1K resistor in there. Yes? All right. So these other elements are more for real life instances, um, cases. So you guys have taken a FIGS2 course, right? You guys understand the concept of like how a motor is driven. So the idea is, you know, there's this, there's this formula called like force is equal to current times the length times the mag magnetic value. So in fact, the matter is when it comes to these motors, you have a, a coil of wire that has a magnet on it. And when you drive a current across, it causes things to spin, right? Because the force actually creates a torque. So effectively, motors are inductors in that instance. And the, the inductor formula is that the voltage is equal to the inductance times the change in current over time. All right. So this, causes, this does present itself a problem because when I turn things on and off, what's going to happen is the current quickly changes and that's going to result in voltage spikes. And we don't want to have that happen. So I took this from a website and here's exactly what happens. So in this instance, some person outputted a, PW, a signal, a digital pin that turns on and off. And you can see the output of the current from the motor. You can see that when it turns immediately on, there's this massive current spike. And then when you turn it off, there's a massive negative current spike. And you don't want to have these current spikes because what, that could also negatively impact your microcontroller because it'll get that negative current and it'll pretty much mess up your microcontroller. So a couple ways to compensate for that is that we have a diode that drives it back to, drives it back to five volts. So the concept of a diode is, is it's effectively like a one-way valve. Right, so in this, the current can only be driven into, into this direction, so from this area to this area. And the only way that can work is if that, this area has a higher voltage than this area. So in the instances, if this generates a very, very high voltage signal, the current is going to go back here instead of going back down there, because this is effectively now short. Okay, so there's another thing to keep in mind is that capacitors um, have this nice little property where they actually help to remove, remove voltage ripple. Um, so if you see in the previous case, you can see that there's some ripple here and there. Um, but by having the capacitor, you can make that, you can make that ripple very, very small. Um, and to be perfectly honest, if you actually go back to the previous slide, you can see that this guy is delivering 24 volts. Um, we're only delivering five. So this really isn't, so, this additional circuit isn't really necessary for what we're doing, but in terms of educational purposes and you're driving like any sort of motor, just to scale up, make sure that you add these components to it. You'll need to select a diode that meets your current particular, um, that meets your requirements, and you'll need a capacitor that's good enough. In our case, we only need 100 nanofarads, but if you were to use like a larger, if you were to use a larger motor, you're going to definitely need a larger capacitor, and you're definitely going to need a diode that responds really, really quickly. Um, so these are just these these two L components that we're adding to it are just very, very like layman general purpose like diodes and capacitors. So we're not going to think too much here. This is something that if you ever were to scale up and think about and you have a really hard engineering problem, you'll figure out using just math or anything that you learn within your class. Okay? All right, so the motor circuit is now complete. I've explained exactly how these elements work. Just to go again, motor is powered by five volts. There's a transistor that turns it on. We have those basic elements to remove voltage spikes as a result of the motor turning on and off. Okay? All right, um, yeah, so again, diode polarity. Make sure you keep that in mind. Um, so we have two types of diodes. Well, I only provided you one diode, which is the one that is the red one with the black end on it. So the concept is the black end indicates this little line right here. And so you want to make sure the black one connects to five volts. You want to make sure that this one connects, you want to make sure that the other, uh, other end connects to the motor. Do you guys see that? Yes? Again, you can like sit down right here if you want to. Just Good? Yes? You guys see that? Okay, cool. Um, so now, here is the circuit. So we want to go ahead and wire this up and make it so that you use the blink code to turn the motor on and off, okay? So don't change the code, just make sure that you can connect the pin 10 to the motor using the specified schematic that I provided. Yes, do you guys see this? Cool. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. Okay, you got yours to work. What about you guys? Yeah, it's fine. I'm just fine going with this. Yeah. Um, okay, so can I move on? Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Okay, so you guys now have it so that your motor is vibrating, yes? 
Yes, and you guys have had fun with it, and the breadboard is buzzing. Perfect. Um, so, there's this one funny issue when it comes to digital outputs. You can only generate an either a high signal or a low signal, right? So you can either have the motor turned on or turned off. This is kind of problematic for us because we want to be able to make it so the motor, you know, can change the amount of the strength of vibration depending on how far away you are from an object, right? So there's just one trick. It's called PWM. That means pulse width modulation. And the concept of this is that when your signal, when you turn it on and off really, really quickly, digital pin is very, 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 very fast. On average, overall, it's actually going to be some sort of middle voltage value. And this works for, for like LEDs and this works for motors. This does not work well for systems that respond very, very quickly to changes in voltages. Because it takes a while for the motor to jump up to its maximum speed and go down to its lowest speed. This actually does work as a mechanism to make it so the motor will actually vibrate in some sort of middle value. Um, so you can actually make it so that if you make it so that it's, it's high for like, some, for like a very, very small section of the time, the vibrate will buzz very, very softly, and it's turned on all, all the time, and it's gonna, it's gonna buzz very, very strongly. And you can adjust these duty cycles. So you can make so 25% of the time it's on, 50% of the time it's on, 75% of the time it's on, and you do that in code. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. So the next thing is we're gonna go ahead and use um, PWM, or analog write in this case. So analog write is the way to actually output a digital signal that is a value between zero and 255. And I'll go ahead and we'll work together and do this together. So I'm gonna code with you guys just to make this work, just to make this work, okay? Yes, we'll do this. All right, so what pin do you guys have this set to? 10, okay, cool. Um, so the, again, the, the first part of this is you wanna go ahead and just um, do pin mode. You guys have some of this code already, but you have to make some edits to it. Um, so 10, we wanna make this an output, right? Because we're outputting a digital signal, yes? Okay. So, um, actually another thing, do you, so you guys are familiar with C and C++, right? So if I give you, a, if I give you something, it won't, over, it won't overload your minds. Do you guys know about the, the pound sign define thing in C? Yes, you guys know that? So the concept of, this, of what this, a pound sign means when it comes to C is it's a compiler code. So what this pretty much means is before I compile any of this and throw it into the microcontroller, I want you to do this one thing first. So when it comes to pound sign define, that means whenever you see this thing, I want you to replace it with this thing. So I'm gonna go ahead and call this motor, and I'm gonna go ahead and say space 10. So whenever it sees a thing called motor, it's gonna replace that with 10. This saves you a lot of time because you don't have to write 10 consistently, you just write motor, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and change this and call it motor. Okay? All right. So. We want to go ahead and output some sort of moderate signal. Actually, it might, it's a lot more fun if we can make it so that it outputs a signal between 0 and 255 and 255 and back to 0. So what's going to happen is the motor is going to buzz really, really strongly and it's going to buzz slowly and weakly again. We can do that again. Um, so we're going to go ahead and play with for loops and we're going to go ahead and just do that. So you guys are familiar with um, Java or like C and C++. You guys are aware of what a for loop does. It IU rates integer i or whatever you want to set this to. So I want to say in i is equal to zero. And I'm going to go ahead and say, um, it's going to run this for loop consistently as long as if i is less than or equal to 255. And I'm going to go ahead and say i plus plus. Okay? So what this, what, what's going to happen in this for loop is that it's going to run and increase i, an increment i, which we'll use For analog write. And again, the, the general concept with analog write is that you can define which digital pin you want to use and you change the duty cycle. And the duty cycle is the number, number between 0 and 255. 0 means it's absolutely off all the time. 255 means it's 5 volts consistently. 128 means it's on and off 50% of the time. You can get those middle ranges if you want by setting um, the, or the, the according integer value. Yes? Getting this? Okay, cool. Okay, um, back to this. So I want to go ahead and just say analog write motor. Oh, there's a comma right here. Missed that right there. I want to go ahead and say i. 
And again, the key issue with doing this is that this code is going to run really, really fast. So we want to have some sort of delay to it. Okay, so we're going to make it delay a bit. So we're going to make it delay, we'll say 100 milliseconds. Okay, very, very arbitrary. Cool? Everyone following along? Okay, so this, this incremented to 255. So now at the end of this for loop, it's now like at its maximum like vibration levels. Now I'm going to go ahead and drop it down back to zero. So we're going to go ahead and say for, again, integer i is equal to 255. You say i is greater than, as long as if i is greater than or equal to zero, uh, we're going to say i minus minus. Okay, and we're going to do the exact same thing over again. We're just go ahead and say analog right motor. Give it i, which is the value that's increment that's actually decrementing down from 255, and we'll give it a delay 100 milliseconds again. Okay, we're good. Everyone understand how this code works? So this increments i. I is going to get tossed into analog right. Analog right is going to actuate that motor based depending on what that value is. 255 means it's going to output just pure 5 volts. 128 means it's going to pulse on and off 50% of the time. Um, zero means absolutely off. Okay, and then the next for loop is it's going to drop back, to, back down to zero. It's going to loop again, so it's going to go up and down consistently over and over. Okay, so let's go ahead and upload this code. So I'm going to go ahead and hit upload. Well, I want to save this, so this is a motor sketch. Save. Okay, your should be, I think your code should be working. Okay, your code I believe works. Everyone's good. PDOM is working. Perfect. The worst of it is about done, and it's almost eight o'clock, which is unfortunate. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and try our best to get to the very ends of this. All right, so we have that working. Yes, everyone, everyone has that. It's solid. Cool. Now we're gonna go ahead and play with the sensors. Um, so I skip all this. We did this already. Cool. Now the infrared proximity. Um, so the way that the sensor works is it effectively has two little infrared LEDs. One of them outputs an infrared signal and the other one picks it up. And depending on the triangulation of the, the way that it picks things up, it's going to output a voltage signal that's dependent on it. And so the idea is when your signal is, when your object is very, very close, it's going to output a very, very high voltage. And when it's very, very far away from you, it's going to send out a very, very low voltage signal. All right. So we had this one issue. Um, there's a, there's a couple of limitations with this. So because it's, it's picking up infrared signals, um, if you ever were to just like get it, grab like a general television like remote and just point at it, you'll mess things up. Um, it doesn't work too well in clear objects, though I've had very, a lot of successes, I've seen people, though I've seen people complain about it. Um, so it's not a perfect like a proximity sensor, but it does its job for what we need to prove in terms of this like educational experience. Um, the case that, that we, the thing that we have in mind um, is that this has a range between 15, uh, 15 and 150 centimeters. You'll find out that if you go below the, the 15 centimeter range, it actually becomes, it actually becomes nonlinear. So it actually decreases in value. Um, and generally speaking, 15 centimeters in, indicates 2.8 volts and 150 centimeters indicates 0.4 volts. All right. Um, I'm going to go back to these digital pins. Um, so again, we had the thing where digital pins can read only zeros or ones. It can't pick up anything in between. So there is a problem where you can't use digital pins to pick up the signal from this infrared sensor. So this is why we have the analog pins. So we're going to go ahead and connect that to the analog pins. Um, so we're going to go ahead and hook it up. So what you have is you're going to have that proximity sensor. You have um, the connectors. And you want to go ahead and connect it up where um, one, the red pin is connected to 5 volts, the black pin is connected to ground, and the signal line can be connected to any analog pin you want. Just make sure that when you, when you write the code up, you know that the cor what the corresponding pin is. I use analog 5 just because it was convenient. Everyone good? Has it, does anyone have a little setup? Okay, we can move on to the next thing. So we're going to use this one function called analog read. Um, and the way that it works is that analog digital conversion is actually a fairly difficult topic to cover, but I'm going to try my best to explain this. Um, you're going to say analog read, whatever analog pin you want, it'll output an integer value. 
the integer value corresponds to the voltage that it picks up. And it, this is kind of one of the key constraints when it comes to analog to digital conversion. Um, so when I say analog to digital conversion, what that means is we're getting an analog signal, so a variable voltage signal. You want to convert it to a digital value, so something that can be expressed in zeros and ones. Um, the way that this works is that it's going to map the voltages that it has to specific numbers. And there's a limitation with this where if you go anywhere beyond its power range, you won't be able to pick it up. Okay? So zero volts will correspond to a zero integer value. Five volts will correspond to 1,023. Anything in between zero volts and five volts, it'll try its best to get to an integer value. It won't be able to pick up very, very small voltages, but that's not important for us. Um, we can still be able to pick up a range, and we just need to get a general sense of how far things are. So that's, that's fine. Um, the image on the, on the right um, actually gives you a more a much broader assessment of what exactly happens. So you have a signal that's green, and then the blue arrows indicate when the microcontroller is going to sample something. So it doesn't, it doesn't actually, it's not going to extract a continuous stream of data. There's going to be some time where it converts that signal into a digital signal and interprets it. And then it's going to try its best to get as close to the voltage signal as possible accordingly. So that's that. 1023 means 10 bits, so it has 10 bit resolution is the limitation of the Arduino. Okay? All right. So, um, some quick calculations. You can eventually find out that, through my basic calculation, you can find out that the, the, res the general res resolution is roughly 0.27 centimeters, uh, which is really handy for us, um, but you'll find out that it's not really the case. And you're going to have to figure out exactly what kind of adjustments you need to make to figure out what, is clo what means close and what means far to you. Okay? Yes? All right. So we're gonna go ahead and with the next code program, we're gonna go ahead and do this. We're going to do something where we're going to send the data to your computer. You can read it on your computer and you can go ahead and play with the infrared sensor to figure out what a near value means and what a far value means, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and code with you guys to do this. So I wanna go ahead and open up a new sketch. Well, actually I have the old sketch, but it's best to, for me to just start from scratch to help work with you guys here. Um, so we want to go ahead and define whatever pin you have. I'm just going to call this infra, so infrared proximity, pin 5, right? Did you guys connect this to analog pin 5? You need to change it accordingly to where you, which analog pin you set this to, all right? OK, so as you see here, the Arduino is connected to our computer with a USB. Um, what you have to do now is use the, this code called serial, or this function called serial, to initiate a command, to initiate, a, initiate some sort of like communication line with the USB so that the computer can read stuff. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and say serial.begin. This means to initialize the connection to your USB, and you want to throw into here 9,600. Um, it's just a very basic. The number you put in here is variable to what you want. That means the amount of, the, the, that is pretty much the baud rate. So the amount of bits that get transferred per, se per second. So 9,600 is a common standard. We're just gonna go ahead and use that. All right. Now, um, just for the case of proving a point, I can do this. So I can do serial dot print line. And I can print text, I can print any sort of text that I want. So I'm gonna say hello world. Okay. And I want to make it delay some amount of time. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and program my microcontroller. We're going to call this serial test. And once you have this code up and running, what we can do is actually go to the serial monitor. So on the very right over here is a little button that says serial monitor. I want you to go ahead and click it. And if you, things are, if you have things set up right, what's going to happen, what's happening now is it's reading the Arduino and it's printing onto this display and it's outputting hello world every 500 milliseconds. Do you guys see that? Yes? Good? Okay, cool. We can move on to the next part. So now we're going to go actually use analog read. So I want to go ahead and comment these sections out because I'm not using these anymore. And what we want to do is we want to say int value is equal to analog write, or analog read, sorry, infra, or whatever pin you're using for that's reading up the infrared signal, okay? And I want to go ahead and just print that out. So I just want to say serial.println value, 
And I don't want to make it so that it, it instantaneously sends this out too quickly because we want to be able to actually read and interpret it. So I'm going to go ahead and just you make it delay like 100 milliseconds so that it's something that I can at least see on the, on the screen. Okay, and go ahead and program your microcontroller to do that. And go to your serial monitor. And if you do it right, it's outputting what it's picking up. So 63 in my case is something where it's picking up nothing. But when I put my hand over the infrared sensor, you can see that increases in value. And I go ahead, go away from it, it goes back down to 63. Okay, do you see that? Do you have yours connected accordingly? I mean, the numbers are fine, but like, when I yeah, it does it change values? Yeah, it changes values. Okay, so this is always a key issue where just like every single sensor needs to be calibrated. So as long as you can see changes when you put your hand close to it, it's fine. Okay, so it's not, it's not always going to be 63 in everyone's case. It's going to be some different value. Just make sure that when you put your hand over it, it increases in value. Because that's all that we really need. We just want to be able to pick up some sort of change. Okay? So again, just like, and, and then if you guys play with it enough, you'll find out that actually once you get to 15 centimeters, it actually is going to decrease in value. So I'm going to go ahead and show that to you guys. So I get closer and closer, at some point in time, it's going to drop. So optimally, it's going to read 600 at some point in time. And then if you go, if you go further than that, it's actually going to drop significantly. You're good, you're good. You're good, you have a minor Arduino bug. Can we move on? Because we have five minutes before eight o'clock. Perfect. Okay, so we have, we have the two elements together. You can actuate a motor now, you can pick up an infrared signal and the relative range of things. And because you've played around with the infrared sensor, you understand where your, what your minimum value is and what your maximum value is, yes? Okay, cool. We wanna go ahead and do work in the final assembly. So we're going to use the map function, which will help us out a little bit. And we're going to go ahead and map that value accordingly to the power, to the strength of vibration motor that we want to set it to. Okay? So let's go ahead and go back to our code, and we'll do that. Yeah? You guys are working just fine? Can I, can I go on? Is it okay? Cool. All right, so I actually have my old code. which I'm going to be using because I am a cheapskate. Okay, so I am going to explain how my code works. Um, mine is very, very arbitrary. You can do whatever you want, okay? This is something that I just figured within a five minute time frame, this seems to be the best way to do things. So as always, mine buzzes when it gets too close. When it goes too far away, it turns off. Okay, so you already, so make sure you have, you have a pin mode output. So make sure that your motor is set to an output value. And you wanna go ahead and read the analog value to some integer value, to some int, okay? And then you want to, with that, scale it accordingly between a value of zero and 255. So what I do is I use the map function. And the way that map function works is that you throw in here whatever you wanna scale it to you throw here the minimum value of the output, the maximum value of output, and then scale it accordingly to these two values. So I'm pretty much saying that 60 is gonna be 20, 300 is gonna be 255. Convert that and, and save it into convert. Do you guys see that? That's what the map function is doing. I can change this to whatever I want. So if I wanna, if I wanna make it so that this is 600 and 600 means 255, I can just go ahead and write that up. So I can do that right now. There's a particular reason why I decided to select 20 as opposed to zero. Um, the reason for that is my, my motor doesn't buzz really well when it's less than 20. So I compensated for that by making so that the, the absolute smallest value it's gonna get is 20 for the analog write. Is that making sense? You guys, you guys seeing that? Another thing to compensate is that there are some instances where if it's less than 60, it's going to be less than 20, or if it's greater than 600, it's going to be greater than 255. You want to compensate for that. So I have, in the, I have right underneath it two if statements that help to compensate for that. So in the case where my, my value is less than 20, I just change convert to zero, 
If it's greater than 255, I just want to make it sure that it's absolutely at maximum 255. Okay? And again, you guys don't need to have to copy. You don't need to copy my code verbatim. This is just a, this is a, a quick thing. What is the huh? what are the numbers on the last again? Okay, so, so the output. output. I the first two numbers are the things that I want to scale it to. So the range of the, the my, my ranges of output. Okay, so the, the my range of output I want to say is between 60 and 600, okay. because that is what we've picked up, or whatever you've picked up, you use. And then, based on that. If you get a 60, I want to make it so that the output is a 20, and if you get a 600, the output is 255. Oh. Anything in between that is a rough value between, between 20 and 255. Okay, and you feed that into the motor. Yeah, you, and then I save it into an integer, that, that means convert, and then I just throw it and throw it into the motor. Okay. And then I do, uh, the if statements are just compensation of, because analog write can only, can only get something between 0 and 255, you want to make sure that you don't get any negative values or any sort of values greater than 255. Those are the two compensating factors you need to incorporate. So you're going from 10 bit to uh, what, what zero? 8 bits. 8 bits. Right. 0 to 255, yeah. So you're understanding this stuff. Yeah. Cool. Yours working? Everyone good? Is yours working? Yours working as well? Okay, so we have roughly two minutes left before 8 o'clock. Um, the question now is, are you guys willing to stay for the next 15 minutes so I can cover another sensing modality for you guys? Okay, so I can do that. Um, you guys are willing to wait, we, you guys are willing to stay another 15 minutes, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. We're going to go ahead and try the other sensing modality then. Um, so this was supposed to be the end of the tutorial, um, but we can work on the next modality. Um, so this is the ultrasonic sensors, and I'm going to go ahead and give you guys the ultrasonic sensors. Um, let's see where they are right now. They should be in this bag. So everyone go ahead and grab one. Sorry, can you wait until like 8 o'clock or no? What? Can you stay after 8 o'clock or? Um, I actually still have a few minutes, but. Okay. Yeah. Okay, just so you guys know this workshop was hosted by the Medical Network. If you guys are interested in other similar workshops, you'd like our page on Facebook for more information about upcoming workshops. So, I gotta head out, but hope you guys enjoy the rest of it. Okay. All right. And are you okay with cleaning up or anything? If not, then I can come back and like, if you can. I like it if you could. Yeah, definitely. That'd be yeah. great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're going to go ahead. I'll let you guys do what you guys are doing. Cool. We're going to go on to ultrasonic sensors. All right. So this was actually the sensor they used in the original, in the original like blind man's, like blind man's glove. And the way that it works is that it outputs a ultrasonic signal. So a very, very, very high pitched very, very high pitched sound, it comes back and they figure out the time it takes for it, the time it took for it to come back. And based off that, you can get a sense of distance. Yeah? Um, so the way that these sensors work is you output to the trigger pin a digital pulse. So typically it's 10 microseconds. And then you read back the, the length of the pulse that comes back in the echo pin. And VCC and ground just means 5 volts and 0 volts. Okay? So with that in mind, the con again, I want to go ahead and re re rephrase this again. So to actuate this or to pick up a, a signal, I send out a 10 millisecond digital pulse. So it you know, goes from 0 to 5 volts, 5 volts back to 0 volts. Then I read in the echo using you know, digital in how long it stays for 5 volts. And then based off that time, that is a time it took for that sound to come back. And there are some obvious limitations to this, but we're going to go ahead and do this now. Um, because we don't have much time. Go ahead and connect it up. So you want to make sure that, again, VCC is connected to 5 volts, ground is connected to 0 volts, trigger is connected to one digital pin, and echo is connected to another digital pin. And make sure you know which one is connected to echo and which, is, which one is connected to trigger. In my instance, I connected trigger to pin, 
I believe, seven, and I connected Echo to pin, actually, it was, yeah, trigger is pin seven, and Echo is pin six. That is what I did. Are we good? You guys good? Everyone's, is everyone connected up? Okay, so the function we're gonna use that's gonna be unique to what we haven't covered is the function called pulse in. So pulse in is a function that reads in how long something stays high, or say, reads that stays at five volts or zero volts, depending what you what you put in. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and go back to my old code and we'll explain to you exactly how my old code works, just for the interest of time. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and find my code. <coughs> I want to go to my sketchbook, and this one should be called ultrasound test. All right, so as always, it's very, very, it's just generally nice to have it so that you, we, we can read in the values and correspond them, make them, you can correspond them accordingly. Your mileage is gonna vary between each ultrasound sonic sensor, so it's gonna require you to go ahead and calibrate yourself. So I'm gonna go ahead and comment out some of my old code that is not useful. just so that we can get a general sense of what the output is. And I'm gonna make it delay 100 milliseconds. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and upload this. Um, so the way that your code should work is it should work as follows. Um, you want to go ahead and initialize your trigger and echo pins. So make sure you know which one was connected to trigger and which one was connected to echo. In my instance, I connected trigger to six and I, conne and I, connected, to, I connected echo to seven. Okay. And you want to make sure that trigger is an output because we're going to output a five volt pulse. Echo is going to be your input because you're going to read in how long it stays for five volts in that time frame. Okay. And um, you want to just initialize trigger to low in our instance because if you were to start off as five volts, it might accidentally start the, start the sensor signal and it might just mess things up. That's what I did in the serial setup. That's why I did that in setup, okay? Everyone good? And this, you might, you can do this later, but it's not, um, but I went and defined a variable called time response and I set it to a long. So long, if you guys aren't, you guys aren't very code savvy. Long means it's just, in our instance, a 32-bit integer. So it can read a value between, I believe, like negative 1.6 million to 1.6 million, roughly in that range. Okay, so again, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna go ahead and pulse a 10 microsecond um, signal. So use the function called delay microseconds. Whatever you throw into here is an integer value that corresponds to the milliseconds you wanna make it delay. Um, I did it so that it first starts low and I just make it wait three microseconds just for it to settle down. Set to, and then I set it to high. Keep it high for 10 microseconds and I set it back to low. That's what my code is doing right here. So I'm sending out that pulse and then the next line is I'm gonna read how long it takes, how long the echo pin stays at five volts and save that into a time response. That's what it's doing, okay? So a pulse in, you wanna define which, which pin you wanna like read which pin you want to read, and if you want to read for how long, for which setting. So again, you can read for, you can read it whether or not it's low or high, but we want to read when it's high. So that's why the second argument, or the second thing that you put into pulse in is, is, is high, okay? You want to save this into some integer value, make sure it's set to long, because again, because this is in the value of microseconds, you could get like, you know, one second could probably mean like a million you can get an output of a million. So you want to be able to handle that appropriately. All right? I went ahead and just printed it out and I just said time, this amount of time and the amount of microseconds it took and I just made a delay a bit. You guys good with that? And if mine is working appropriately, 
it's not working. So mine is not working, so that's bad. Um, that's probably because of pin disconnection. Um, okay, so mine isn't functioning. It worked when I wasn't around, as always. Um, but you should be able to get something where if you're farther away, the time, the value increases, and if you get closer to it, the value should decrease. Is what you, what you should be getting. How many microseconds do you delay for? 10 microseconds. Oh, wait. Actually, that could be the issue. Um, sorry. Um, change that to 5. 10 microseconds was a typical thing. Hours functions a bit differently, and it works on um, five microsecond pulse instead. I believe is what the issue is happening. Yeah, Yours works? Good. What about you guys? Okay, I'm going to skip the whole concept of how to output the motor accordingly. You know how the ultrasonic sensor works. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up today and say that you guys now know how to make a blind man's cane. There's obviously more things you can add to this. So we, you're obviously powering this on a USB cable. You can output it. You can power this on a 9 volt battery. The way that you can do that is you can actually grab one of these cables over here, um, connect this to the barrel jack, and connect the other end to a 9 volt battery. And then, so with that in mind, if you just assemble it up accordingly, you should be able to make a blind man's glove. Is everyone happy? Did everyone get a nice experience out of this? Is everyone good? Cool. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and say, call it a day. Um, and just some final words. So again, this was just to get you into the concept of Arduino, um, but there's obviously more to learn. Um, so make sure if you ever wanna learn more Arduino stuff, there's the, obviously the reference website. So the website itself has all the libraries, all the references, all the examples, all the projects listed that can help you really learn how to use all the capabilities of the Arduino. Um, the Playground provides plenty of projects you can see and check out. Um, we only covered only the, you know, the tip of the iceberg of what an Arduino is capable of. Overall, um, this is something that you just learn iteratively, go online and figure out more things to do. Um, as always, you know, if you have any questions, um, so we have BMA Builds, it's a YouTube channel that I'm running, which is helping to make um, pretty much electronic tutorial videos. We have videos on how to program microcontrollers, not Arduino, but ARM-based microcontrollers. And that's the email that's connected to the YouTube website. If you have any questions, go ahead and send an email to that. I'll try my best to respond to you within you know, a couple days time if you have any problems. Aaron, good? Okay. Um, if so, then I would just, you know, just like to ask like, um, if you can help to like, just keep things organized, um, maybe go ahead and disassemble what you have. Um, and then um, I'll go ahead and just clean it up and we'll, you can just pretty much leave after that. All right, thank you very much for coming in.